Welcome to Point of Order, our live special segment of the show, which we record live every Wednesday night at 7.45 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're a little bit late, but we wanted to make sure our guest host of the night, Miss Maddie McMillan, would be comfortable. We sat down. We had a chat before we started going live. Uh, Sarah Biggs, our regular co-host, is still under the weather a little bit, so she is home recovering, getting her voice back. She will be back next week. But Maddie, 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 thank you so much for filling in for Sarah. It is an honor and a pleasure. And for those who are tuning in live right now, I should just let you know, Maddie will be back with us next Thursday. We'll talk about that a little bit later for an actual episode of the show. But uh, right here, right now, Maddie, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. And thank you, those uh, watching on YouTube right now. That's great that, to join you. It's exciting to talk about politics. Well, I'm very happy to talk about politics as well. And uh, as you see, if uh, well, Maddie can't because we're talking via Zoom, but through the power of technology, we're going to be talking about the three men off to my side right there, which is Jason Kenney and the UCP, the, the uh, Conservative Party leadership race, and that is with Pierre Polyev, and then conservatism not only here in Canada but around the world. And yes, we will probably talk about Boris Johnson for a little bit because he kind of had a very tough week a little uh, earlier this week as well but maddie i want to start with this uh for those who don't know who you are for those who are tuning in who are about to listen to this um uh for those who are uh tuning in a little bit later uh who are you and what brings you to the political realm of alberta howdy chris thanks again for having me um I'm Maddie McMillan. My pronouns, she, her, they, them. I'm a policy analyst in the world of Alberta. I've been in politics in and around uh, the spheres of, that impact Calgary uh, for about a decade, but uh, coming into my own, especially after coming out. And I'm the principal of Cupola Policy and Strategy. You can find me on Twitter and on other social media at Rocky Mountain Natty. <laughs> Awesome. I think that's all my plug. <laughs> that, that's your plug for now, but we will probably have a few more throughout the day for the next hour. Um, I want to talk about the conservative race. Let's start federally first. And um, membership cutoff ended earlier last week. I think actually uh, end of uh, literally Friday. Um, and I have some numbers here. According to the Conservative Party of Canada, they have sold over 600,000, over half a million, well, over 600,000 members have signed up to vote in the upcoming September 10th leadership race. This is far ex ex uh, exceeding what Justin Trudeau sold in 2013 when he won the leadership race in uh, for the Liberal Party. Are you shocked at this number? Are people engaged? Are people happy? Because uh, for just some clarification note, in 2020, when Aaron O'Toole won, there was only 269,000 memberships sold. So this is almost double what they sold in 2020. Are you surprised? Uh, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. I mean... There, it, it seems like a big jump to almost triple over that short period of time, but a lot of politics have touched these people in that period of time. Uh, a lot of it has divided, a lot of it has united and brought new people into folds who otherwise would have been off in ventures in PPC land or elsewhere. Um, but it's really exciting to see the, the candidates sort of jockey and then the party hold back and highlight that it's paid memberships as opposed to sort of leaning to an open membership sort of system but uh i don't know it's it's interesting to watch and it's good to note but it's also there's more canadians every day uh yeah which i i agree with you wholeheartedly on that and the reason i say that is because uh, you, you mentioned it briefly there. Uh, in 2013, the Liberals had a open membership. You basically signed up. Yeah. You were a member. It didn't. You didn't have to pay. It was a you signed up and you became a member. I'm not sure if that was actually during the leadership race or afterwards, but it was closely afterwards. So this is 600,000 paying members Dang. to vote. This is a big fundraising hall for them which the conservatives lost the fourth quarter for fundraising in the last election in 2021 so this puts them on good footing heading into a 
new well, I should I shouldn't say new year because September is not really a new year because by September it's already halfway or almost it's all the way. It's a new gone. calendar year for <laughs> teachers. There you go. Exactly. For teachers, that's a good fundraising haul. Um but the big number that came out was from the Pierre Polyev camp, and he is the perceived front runner in this race. I, I, there are people who might agree or disagree with that, but he is the perceived front runner. And he, his team, I should say, says that he sold over half of that 600,000 new memberships. Is he an unstoppable force, do you think? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> Why not? Um, not just personally, but for, for the system. Uh, if you look at the wave of his base and you look at sort of the timeline of things, this isn't his first kick at the can per se. He had a spotlight and a chance last go and he said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay back. A lot has happened since then, including a wave of unchecked populism of extreme proportions. Uh, jacuzzis on the lawn of front lawn of parliament and uh, part minister and that's changed um a lot of people rallied and riled up at that point uh yes does he have momentum it, i don't know because like he has that large base starting uh it appears to be concentrated of areas of lower point importance or lower lower point return in the system uh but it He's the person who's perceived at front, and there's inherent uh, benefits to that. He was the first person to, I think he was the first person to sort of talk about numbers of all the party, uh, uh, of all the candidates, which is strange because if if you have if you have a good hand, you, you sort of wait to see how others play them so that you can leverage it. So, so maybe it's theater, maybe it's truth, but I think it's a bit in between. I, I appreciate what you said there because uh, for those who don't know, and Maddie and I probably are weird people when it comes to knowing politics and the inner workings of parties, but the Conservative Party is not a one-member, one-vote leadership. So everyone's vote does not weigh the same across Canada. So in the Conservative movement, we talked about this a little bit last night when we we had Jay Hill on the show, uh, former leader of the Maverick Party, former government house leader for Stephen Harper. He talked about the fact that uh, in their system, the Conservatives, each riding is given 100 points. Uh, so if your riding has over 100, up to, me- up to 100 points. If your, if your riding has over 100 members, you get 100 votes at the convention so your uh, if your riding only has a hundred members your riding sort of is weight the same way as a riding that has here in calgary five thousand members so it doesn't matter at the end of the day how much you've sold it's where you've sold and where in canada have you sold and i when i saw the number of three hundred eighteen thousand, i think the number was i was shocked But the first thing I asked was, where are they from? If they're all from Western Canada, that doesn't really bode well for a Quebec vote or an Ontario vote. You you alluded to it uh, quickly there, but I want to jump into a little bit further is being the first out of the gate with your numbers, that it could spell trouble as well at the same time, couldn't it? Because you're saying... Go ahead. If you have a very good hand to play, uh, there's there's benefits to holding back, and there's also benefits to using right away. You, if you have big firepower and you think that you need to nip stuff in the bud now, use that firepower now. But the membership sales are closed, yeah. And now it's about converting people in between. So, do you think people can do that? Trying- Part? Do you think people can do that? Do you think leadership candidates, because if I bought a membership for a uh, candidate, I'm not going to go vote for another candidate unless they do something completely stupid. Do you think the average person who would bought, who would have bought a membership for Pierre Polyev would say, OK, he said something about the WEF, so I'm going to go t- I'm going to go vote for John Charest now. Or do you think Pierre's numbers are I- kind of solid? Let's say I'm a Leslin Lewis supporter. And I want a winner. And maybe I'm shaky. Last time she had the most number of votes, but the, not the math and how it sit, sits in for representation. 
if I see Pierre is firmly in the lead before other people say any of their numbers, I'm not going to maybe pay attention to the other folks. It's Leslin and Pierre, and maybe that's okay with me compared to how I might see the others. I think it's also just just to go back to another point. Um, uh, it's it's not just where you've sold, but also where others have sold in comparison to you. Because if you you're selling in areas of high competition for second choices sort of situation, that might impact things differently. Differently, Jean Charest and uh, Scott Mayor At- Brown, Mayor Pat, Mayor Mayor Brown and, uh, and Scott Agenson and Roman Babber. Yeah, so there's there's play in where you are. Pierre centralized in uh, in Alberta, but he has a bit of share in Quebec. I I think it plays into sort of setting up the stage. We've moved from an uh, from a point of asking for sales to asking and mobilizing and identifying chance of return on getting people to vote and this is the early days so maybe Pierre is this is the first chapter after membership sales I am definitely in the lead no matter what anyone will say after me well like, and that's setting a new stage yeah because I, I when uh, so Matt uh, Patrick Brown was the very like literally the day after the uh, membership sold Patrick Brown came out and said he had sold yeah. 150,000 which is still an incredible haul if you ask me but then John Sheree kind of shortly afterwards said, we have the Tens path. Of thousands or thousands? No, he said, we have the path to win with points. So he didn't, he didn't say anything. Yeah. About, he didn't say anything about the number he sold. He said the path to win with the points in the system, which made me think, how do you know what other people have sold? Like, unless you have inside information from the, CP, uh, the Conservative Party. Uh- I think it might also just be like Pat, the path to win is that a lot of supporters in Quebec with 20 something seats compared to Alberta with less than 20 seats in parliament, like, or l- less than those balances. Sorry, I might, my numbers are, there's are 50, way off. Th- there's, uh, uh, there's 75, 78 uh, Quebec in Quebec. Way, <laughs> Quebec has way more seats than Alberta is. Um, I'm, I said a silly thing, so I'll say a simpler phrase. There are more seats in Quebec than there are in Alberta. Therefore, if he has the right concentrate and the right setup, that's the path to victory. You don't need to flatten a forest to have a path. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, it is so um, interesting to see what path is going to be taken because at, right now... There's no more debates for the Conservative Party. There's nothing there. No one's going to be talking about anything. Uh, they're literally just going to be talking about social media. Now, John Charest has come out and said, let's debate again. Let's have a third debate. And he has asked Leslie Lewis, who's accepted. He's asked Scott Aitchinson, who's accepted. He's ex- uh, asked Patrick Brown, which Patrick Brown just lost two MP endorsements. So I'm assuming he wants to do that as well. Uh, Pierre hasn't said anything and Roman Babber hasn't said anything. Is it beneficial to have another debate if you're the front runner, do you think? Uh, I think it depends on like how far into the stride you are. Not, not just in your timeline, but looking at the momentum and the waves of others. If you think people are on a bit of a downwards or at the if they're on a down of the waves of up and downs of putting stuff out there, seeing what sticks to the wall uh, and playing averages, it might be great to draw attention at that point of time so that not only do they see a, a comparison, they see something, but then in the days to come, as they're talking at the water cooler, they can see the purported not leaders doing worse. I'm sure there's way better ways of, of phrasing that, but it's basically, it's, if you want to tell a story that you're you're going up and the other ones are going down, the best time to do it is at a snapshot point of your choosing. Yeah. And as a front runner, you can choose. Okay, I'll do the debate, but I can't move my schedule. There's a lot of there's a lot of things one can do better with their time at a debate, depending on what your priorities are. Pierre is Pierre for prime minister, not Pierre for democracy. Uh, <laughs> So, so it's a different sort of priority for his fan base. Do his fan base want to see him say good quotes? Yes, but he can go to lots of things. He can go to a conference, switch in, have someone record it. He can get that elsewhere. 
at the same time, I don't think having a front runner is having the front runner there or not there, like it might not impact. Like let's say Sheree and and Pat Brown, like they're not necessarily going to be picking up any PR support, uh, both in math or, or in numbers, but just people defecting. Yeah. So if he's not there to defend however they want to frame, whether they're working in cahoots or it's just mutually beneficial to to point out he's missing and say things that can be used later that Pierre didn't defend. Now, Pierre might be like tweeting away all night and chirp away and that might be beneficial, but the captive audience at that moment won't have him in the way. Which, uh, so for those who are watching, I should just clarify this, that they tried to hold a third debate prior to the membership cut off but Pierre Polyev said no we're not doing it because it's not sanctioned by the Conservative Party of Canada it was with the independent broadcaster journalists out of Ontario uh, Patrick Brown, Roman Babber and Scott no actually John Charest Scott and Roman had all agreed no one else had so um, if it's mandated or if it's regulated by the party all candidates have to be there so um, they have the option of potentially having a leadership debate in August, the Conservative Party, and that was set in stone prior to this whole thing uh, being uh, all when all the rules and regulations of the uh, governing the uh, Conservative leadership race. It was out there that they had the option to hold the leadership race uh, debate in August if and all the candidates would have to be required to be there. Um, I, I'm in the same opinion as you, though. It. If I was Pierre, I'd be holding my st uh, wall up and saying, okay, if I'm uh, in this debate, I want it on this day. I want this moderator and this, this, and this, and this. Because he has the wind at his back. He just has to figure out how to sail it smoothly without any major screw-ups right now. Because And going into the summer, it's going to be quite easy because you honestly just have to not say anything to any newspaper and you're going to be great for the next three months until the actual uh, votes get sent out. Exactly. And, and you're right, like we're entering barbecue circuit season, but low, not a lot of uptake in broadcasting, but a lot of uptake in one-on-one -on -one relations. Yeah. So if you're a candidate at an unsanctioned party forum that everyone else agrees to, you can get all the sound bites you want, people echoing at Canada Day when we're reflecting on what our country is and what it can be. Uh, stampede, which is a huge season for any political movement. There's chances to circ circulate narratives, and this is when you can plant the seeds. Yeah, and that's something that Pierre might want to avoid too. Like, I've there's just... a reason like shouldn't expend any political capital in that direction. I'm just looking forward to every single leadership candidate being in Calgary for the Calgary Stampede and having all their God-forsaken leadership barbecues and mingling with the people. And if anyone wears a cowboy hat, I'm throwing a fit right there right now. Just because you, you, you're you in Calgary does not mean you have to wear a cowboy hat. That is my two cents on that statement. <laughs> Can I wear my Stetson and my shit kickers? Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. Just no cowboy hats, okay? I, if you're a cowboy, sure, wear the cowboy hat. If you're a politician from Quebec, Ontario, which all of them are, don't come to Alberta thinking that you can win us over by wearing a white Stetson cap. We saw how, how bad that did for Aaron O'Toole, and just don't. <laughs> um I want to turn to our next subject now because we, we talked about that for a good about 20 minutes and I want to make sure we get everything in today. And that's the UCP leadership race. Um, earlier today, Leela Ahir announced that she was in after announcing the day before on Ryan Jesperson that she was in to replace uh, Jason Kenney. Uh, Todd Lowen on Monday announced that sh he was in up in Grand Prairie or Valley View, he announced. Travis Taze announced uh, on Saturday that he was in. Daniel Smith, Brian Jean, and Mayor Bill Rock. I, I apologize, Mayor Bill. I, I don't know where you're from. I, I could have done my research. He's from uh, a, a misc. Okay. Oh yes, a misc. Yeah. Uh, it's for the viewers. It's by Hardesty, and and for the viewers, Hardesty's by Wainwright, and Wainwright's <laughs> by 
Lloyd, but if you go west, it's like two hours from Edmonton. But all you had to say is hard to see because hard to see is where uh, Keystone XL pipeline was supposed to start and then got vetoed by Joe Biden. So you say Keystone XL. Keystone, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> everyone knows. Um, are you shocked? Shoot in the mask. Uh, are you shocked two, four, six candidates have announced already? Well, I should say Brian Jean announced like the day he won his by-election up in Fort McMurray that he was running for the leadership. Daniel Smith announced at the last SGP in, I think it was April, that she was running if Jason Kenney resigns. Are you shocked that there's so... And there could be still more. I, there's a speculation that there's a few more cabinet ministers who are going to announce. Are you shocked? Uh, Rajan is exploring options. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you shocked with uh, the status of this leadership race so early on with so much interest? Uh, no, I, I really, I think of it more, it's like an F1 race. Everyone is sort of in their spots. They're ready to go. The race is starting. They're showing up to the line ready, limber, like they're stretching. They're not waiting. There's not any point to wait for for what characters these people are playing in this story. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna come out, you're gonna come out now. And if you're Brian Jean, you're gonna come like five years ago. I was gonna say he and lost. He lost the well, leadership, and he, he was announcing. <laughs> I um, I want to ask this question, and I apologize for interrupting because uh, you're from rural yeah, Alberta. Sure. You're from rural Alberta. You oh, you were born and raised in rural Alberta, right? I've lived a lot of my life, but uh, okay. You, uh, the you, home you, that I head to at the end of the week is in Calgary. Okay, it's you a small town south of Balzac. Okay, you lived in a small town south of Balzac. I've spent a lot of summers um, just at what's now the Red Deer Airport. It used to be a, a cadet training center. Spend a lot of time sort of hopping around. Uh, but you're Alberta's bases you're an Albertan, the greater right? Areas. You're an Albertan. That's, yeah, I call okay. myself. Okay, an that's how I'll, I'll clarify that. You are an Albertan. <laughs> you are Albertan through and through. You were born here. You were raised here. You currently reside here. Um, you have a better pulse than I do on Alberta issues. Um, because I'm from I'm from Ontario. Even if I was uh, like moved here when I was five, people would still say I'm an outsider. I'm coming from a different province. Uh, uh, but I, I I live here now with my husband in Northeast Calgary. Yet again, a small city just just south of Balzac. Um, what do the leadership candidates need to do to potentially win both rural, which a lot of UCP members currently reside in? And urban, which Edmonton is a, a orange wave right now, and Calgary is such a toss-up. What does a leadership candidate need to do to win both rural and urban right now? Is it just be honest, or how do they win it? In, in the leadership race, or yeah. To win in the general leadership race. Leadership race stars. first. Let's talk leadership race, and then we'll move into the general afterwards. <laughs> Um, I hinted at it before. I think we definitely have, like, we have a cast of characters coming. Like, we have Leela here, who's truth and daylight. We need to show and expo expose festering. She has a different story than we have, like, two rural people, Todd Lowen, who wants to give, it's not my campaign, it's your campaign. And then Bill, Bill Rock, who is the wild card, who wants to represent rural people, there are people vying for i think your question is what do they have to do to win rural and urban yeah. some of these people that is not the priority really i want to represent i want to win rural i want to win the cities um and just not place poorly in rural i don't want to be the person who's replaces trudeau in this election of conservatism um because was that like, kenny's downfall be was that kenny's downfall was there was always speculation that Kenny was here for uh, not a good time, not a long time, but for a good time. Be here, unite unite the party, beat the NDP, and then go back off to Ottawa and become prime minister. Is that all that the UCP leadership ha candidate has to sort of do to be a credible candidate is I'm here for Alberta. I'm not here for uh, Ottawa. I'm here for you and only you. I, I think if it was a fairy tale, that would be like the nice narrative. 
but there's under roots of politics. If you want to win, uh, there are lots of divisions that you can prey off of. To use a political science term, uh, there's a lot of cleavages that you can wedge, like you, uh, including uh, opinions of rural, urban, uh, elite, grassroots, uh, bringing us forward or making us great again or making us uh, reprehensible, whatever direction. There's camps that you benefit if you abandon another one. So it's a question of will the UCP, to win the UCP and be that hero of conservatism, you have to do that under a big tent. Or you can pull out one of the legs from the tent and know where all your people are so they're protected. Uh, and yeah, it's different paths. Like Bill Rock doesn't care about uh, uniting the party, he, he, but he did contemplate about starting a rural party. Brian Jean has been hooting and hollering about this situation for a very long time, uh, talking and amplifying. It's the vehicle for using Alberta to fight against the feds. Some of these people could parlay into that greater conservative narrative, but I think we have to remember, Kenny, Kenny is an Easterner with Eastern ideologies who flew over here with an intent to always sort of be popular in that mindset. After he left, see, all the media loved him because they don't know Alberta and he's playing for a different stage in the end game. Save the legacy is his game. And I'd say Travis Tate's game too. The ministers who are still around want that legacy to carry on, want that conservative push. Some of the people don't care about that. And maybe that's in their best interest. Maybe it's in Alberta's best interest, but it's really interesting because we are not seeing people pulling together in the same boat. I, I want to talk about Travis Taves here for a second because I was at his leadership announcement uh, here in Calgary. And I, did I, they throw shit on his shirt or did he show up like that? I <laughs> did not ask. That was not the first question out of my mouth because my very first question. Like, I have to wash up before I go to supper from Springbank to Springbrook. Like... <laughs> Lord Tundren. I, I, my very first question to him was a, similar to what you were just talking about. Um, he made a deliberate decision to drive all the way from Grand Prairie after he did a, quote, uh, his words, soft launch of his leadership, to do a massive launch down in Calgary at the uh, Royal House or Rotary House on uh, Stampede Park grounds. And I had asked him the question, why Calgary? Because you think as a rural MLA from Grand Prairie, you would want to do it up there and show that you're a rural Albertan. But he gave this... I, go ahead. So I, I want to hear this. Go ahead. He, he gave this answer about um, he's always considered himself like... Uh, like he, he 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 likes Calgary. He enjoys it. It just seemed very odd to me that the uh, one other place that the UCP are doing semi well is where they've launched their leadership race. I've not seen one candidate announce their leadership race and uh, leadership campaign in Edmonton. You think as a potential leadership candidate, you'd want to try and win over all. Albertans and not just the ones that you currently have to try and keep your majority mandate. He gave this convoluted answer of, I like Calgary. I consider myself home here when I'm in Calgary. And it just seemed very odd to me. And then it got into the questions behind, are you Jason Kenney's like 2.0? Uh, do you find yourself just like the next Jason Kenney? And the, the question is, he said, I'm, I'm my own man. And I uh, like I have different, like my background and Jason Kenney's background was completely separate. But if you look at the list of candidates who have endorsed him for leadership, it's almost a third of his caucus, Jason Kenney's caucus. So is Travis Tao just basically putting blinders on and hoping people don't think that he's Jason Kenney? But he was literally his right-hand man in the caucus because... He was this finance minister, and finance has quite a big profile. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's he's walking a very interesting area, and I think maybe that is why he had shit on his shirt, to highlight, I come from Earl. But 
it doesn't really seem like he's campaigning rural or that's where he'd be successful. He's the guy who made the cuts that led to police departments being underfunded. He's the guy who cut the, who cut the health uh, healthcare and means you have to drive further or you have to not go to the hospital over winter because the roads are too scary for you. I know lots of people like that from Cold Lake and Bonneville all the way down through Hardesty and Hannah. And Coaldale, uh, which is kind of getting completely screwed over right now because the provincial government just put out a news release earlier so, this week saying exactly we have no funding yeah. for police in Coaldale. It's amazing that the same people who cut the funding for Coaldale are asking for support to call on the feds to come in and support. It's it's very apparent that uh, Minister Taves, uh, Mr. Oh no, he's not. He he got that out of the way. But Taves he's still the ECA. honorable Taves. He's still the honorable yeah. Taves. Taves ECA. <laughs> he's he's riding the wake of the Kenny machine to keep the Kenny machine alive. If there's good or bad in whatever legacy there is to have from being affiliated to Kenny, he's either writing it or suffering from someone else not writing it. Because as a finance minister, he's the one who had the pen strokes that put us where we are today. Um, is he the perceived front I, runner? Is he the perceived front runner or is Brian Jean the perceived front runner? Because, it depends uh, if you believe in mainstream media. <laughs> As an independent show, we totally agree that you should support independent news outlets. If Mr. Taves is the, if the Honorable Taves is uh, the front runner, that means he would hypothetically have the math of, Ken, let's say he inherits all of Kenny's support. So 50% plus a few couple thousand bonus uh, memberships. Um there are more there are a lot of people in this race and kenny could only win half like there's a lot of plucking away from that half that can be done there's a lot of tearing apart and i don't see a lot to gain i can't see a path and i'd love to see one where taves is the hero in his own backyard which isn't the case although he inherits some of the klein machinery based up there for like the north of edmonton operation yeah and i think they're affiliated in that way but there are people who can pull away. Anyone who uh, is more of a, a heart and time sort of person is not running towards him. It's people who it's more like, I see a return on my investment on this person. And maybe that's why he came to Calgary. I want to bolster my business and my economic background. And I'm going to come at a time that's just ahead of the, the what became Energy Week, a celebrated yada, yada, yada. Uh, ride that wave build the narrative now so that when people start people keep uh the people you want to inherit from kenny stay with you but the narrative of being the kenny legacy goes away um but everyone's going to be picking away at that he has a lot of uh red ink on his hands <laughs> So I just did quick math while you were talking because I want to talk about this rural-urban divide. So in the last nine premiers, the last nine premiers, so from Kenny all the way back to Lougheed, there's been nine premiers of this province. Only one has come from rural Alberta, and that is Ed Stelmack in 2004, and he did not last that long. So we had Kenny from Calgary, Notley from Edmonton, Prentice from Calgary, Hancock from Edmonton, Redford from Calgary, Stelmack from Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville, if I'm not mistaken, is his, was his writing, but he lived in Vegreville. Um, Go ahead. I, I can appreciate your point, and I think this is something that we forget too often. Uh, Alberta has a benefit of this sort of dual metropolis setup. It's not a it's not a metropolis on a global scale, but it is for the prairies. Yeah. We have the two pr biggest prairie gems, and it draws in a lot of people. A lot of people think there's this rural urban divide. There's there's definitely a, a prairie culture, a prairie nation culture of understanding that I think people who move straight to a metropolis is miss, and that's great to tap into. But like. Rachel Notley is as Berta as it gets, not because she's, a lot of people say she's from Edmonton, but she's from Peace River country yeah. where there is no help for miles. The help is you and your ability to communicate and work with your neighbor. 
We um, all we all know I'm that not, story not, that she tells every I'm single not event so- is her dad I'm, had to go fix some cow fences because uh, he was the only one near, and he was the MLA at the time. So we all know that story, and I agree. And, He's he, the, and he, she is. I'll, from I'll flip it around though. Too. I'll flip it around too though. Like Ed Stelmack, like he was going to go to school, but he had farm obligations, and he had to stay. I think it's it's not a rural urban divide issue. It's a lot of people in rural Alberta, and I think this goes for a lot of. I hear a lot of it from uh, from my country cousins in uh, in God's country, Southwest Manitoba too. It's that every election cycle, city folk come to town and say, all your problems can be solved by us. Uh, Just vote for us blindly. And then they leave and nothing happens. And from the point of view of like townsfolk, I'm going to say townies because there's also you live in the country, you're a townie or you're from the city. Uh, These are people who saw no town, no corporation wants to invest in a grocery store. So we're going to make our own co-op. No, no one want, No one even wants to make money off us. So we're going to have our own United Farmers Association. No one wants to invest in our kids and their in our future. So we're going to have our 4-H and our rodeo. It's community driven, and I think that's when you have this sort of corporate level who says, "Here are the numbers. Here are the return on investments. Here's what Bay Street and New York is going to say." That isn't priorities to these people. It's can I continue to live here and can people thrive here? And can I get about my day as opposed to can I don't want to hear you yapping at me. So I think that's where Taves is like, he's not rural in that point of view, because definitely from the folks that I talk to, he doesn't represent the interest of trust a community knows how a community, how the community operates and support what they need. That ain't Taves. <laughs> Taves is sign a check of the consultant group that says you should hire this person because these metrics say so, and it it works with this grid. Uh, it lo- works really good for business. Will it parlay over to a group that he desperately needs? As you said, there there could be room in Edmonton, but no one's going there first. Yeah, there's not. A, I couldn't imagine a lot of crowds of excitement to to launch a campaign there. Um, let alone ones who'd want to do it so close to Rome. Uh, best talk about Rome further away. <laughs> well, you, you're telling me no one's going to announce their leadership campaign from Sky Palace? I heard that you can rent it out now from the UCP after Notley announced that you could, if they're elected, they'll make it a public building that people can rent out, which it's currently allowed. So you don't see that ever happening? No I would love to see the Sky Palace be a palace for the people because there is a lot of benefit in having your nonprofit being able to operate when they're being recognized or being sought advice uh, by the legislature and the government. It's a great home base, but that's just <laughs> that's, that's just me. We could do shit. a whole hour on just the Sky Palace <laughs> itself. Um, I want to leave on this note, and this is the. Uh, the, the question that I've been asking myself uh, as this started ramping up, can the next UCP leader credibly govern this party if they only get 50 plus 1% of the vote? Because Jason Kenney just told everyone it wasn't the mandate he was looking for. It's not the... It, because he got 51.4%. If the next leader gets 51% of the vote in this leadership race, can they, tech, they, well, technically they can govern, but would it be a credible leadership if they got less than 60% where Jason Kenney said 51% isn't the number he possibly wanted to continue on as leader? I think the best leaders that we've seen and the most effective uh, in in producing their goals and aims are the ones who they accept the mandate they're given to do something. There's a lot of politicians who want to be something, but if you do something with the mandate you're given, you get places because you recognize the reality you're in. Kenny was looking for, it's not the mandate I was looking for, so I'm going to leave it. Whereas saying, 50% of people believe in me first and 50% don't. And I need to lead accordingly to my party uh, and have a system that they will let me lead 
accordingly for the province. And like it's six month leadership and six month election, they can build a narrative. But the issue is the narrative that wins you this leadership race might not be the same narrative that lets you carry a mandate of 50%. Uh, if it's not the mandate you're looking for, you can't use it. If, if it's a mandate that you can accept, then uh, you are accepted to lead. The, the, the last, uh, last question on this before we move into our last segment of the show is the, the name we haven't mentioned yet. Is there we, we talked about Voldemort? Rob, no, well, <coughs> J.K. Rowling. I don't mention de, her. De, depending on if you talk to Twitter, you might think that this one is uh, Voldemort. But uh, she, uh, my husband and her are friends, and uh, she has been rumored that she is going to put her name forward for the leadership. She's a current federal MP for Calgary Nose Hill, Michelle Rempel Gardner. Um, do you think it's beneficial for her to throw her hat in the ring and potentially try to lead this? Being the, uh, as Prentice did in uh, 2013, at, or 2014, sorry, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Kenny did in uh, 2017, come from Ottawa and try to save the day. Uh, does Michelle Rempel Gardner have a chance, do you think? I, I don't see why she'd do it. Um, one, I don't think she could come in as a savior to a lot of folks. Uh, she's, she's the type of person that focuses on local fundraising. So like, let's say if Pierre Polyev came to Calgary to fundraise, there would be issues there. And I think there are linkages that mean she's coming in, maybe not to the most friendly of situations, or at least there are camps that wouldn't be friendly. Um, she's got a pretty good condo. Uh, all her bills are settled. She's got a good tempo. She could move in to a burning house because let's say that she does enter, uh, and she inherits a party that has machinery that doesn't like her, that's spoken against her in the past, that she has spoken against in the past, that she now has to use to, uh, to win a mandate or get cleaved away. Like conservative leaders, uh, they expire quicker than than uh, a lot of things. Um, if she did enter as a savior, though, it it could change the narrative. Like maybe maybe she can pick up and do what Kenny couldn't and save Alberta from crazy people like Albertans, uh, and then go back to federal politics once uh, the that fire is out. But. I don't know if you'd leave if you'd leave a pretty safe gig for that sort of danger. Well, I, the only reason she, I think she's been mentioned a lot lately is because I had she hasn't that, been in the news in a while. She hasn't, but she endorsed Patrick Brown over Pierre Polyev. She uh, got kicked out of the shadow cabinet under Candace Bergen. She is like not doing much on the game of national politics she's written a few things for western standard she's done a few things for other organizations it just to me it seems like she's laying the groundwork to do something and i think that's why a lot of people are watching and that's why the western standard had that article that uh people close to her are saying that she's exploring the opportunity but everyone seems to be exploring the opportunity and no one seems to just want to do it you think you would know if you had yeah. a chance to potentially win if you are thinking about it yeah she's definitely yeah she's definitely up to something but she's always up to something she's a she's a shark with a very strong mind and a strong conviction like she has to keep moving to survive she isn't one to be able to rest on laurels she has to have an issue she has to have an us and she has to have a them now she is not in the same boat as the direction of we have to remember this leadership race was triggered when Aaron O'Toole was out of the country it was triggered because, or no, sorry, sorry, sorry. It was triggered because people who are mad because uh, the vote on conversion therapy was passed unanimously. Uh, people who were out of the country who otherwise would have voted to continue torturing people like me. That's who triggered this whole thing. We don't like Aaron O'Toole because they don't want, because uh, he, he doesn't let us stop the torture of queer people 
called conversion therapy, but it's more like using therapy to torture people into a certain behavior. Um, that is not Michelle Rimple's people. And then like a lot of other Calgary MPs, I don't think she, she sits too comfortably and she speaks up and she walks away from people who would treat fellow Canadians like that. She's in a tough pickle. I think she likes pride stuff and I think she likes a lot of progressive things and she's seeing the party leadership pushing her away from an ability. So maybe maybe she is being pushed towards provincial, but whew, it might just be better for her to sit out, let Pierre or whoever win. There's going to be a, I think there's going to be a divergence of conservatism in Canada between sort of the conservatism of the greater English speaking world and the populism, utility, uh, stamper is in charge conservatism of the Kenny machinery. Um, a brethren of folks from Plymouth is to Cadillacs and whatnot doing business for themselves. You, you mentioned the conservative movement and the fractures that we could potentially see here in the next few weeks months i think years. we are seeing it oh i think we are i think this is the most nastiest yeah. federal leadership i've ever seen in the history of this uh this great country um yet i know we do have our issues but i think it's a great country still yeah even though we do have our issues but everything has its issues. it's the only country where you can accept issues and work to fix them exactly. or go back to getting polio <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um I think this leader, this leadership race in the UCP is going to be echoing somewhat of what we're seeing federally, because I think there is a there is a wild rose PC fight that was not settled under Jason Kenney because everyone just liked Jason Kenney, and when he became leader, it was like okay, Jason Kenney is the strong one. He's the, Stephen Harper's heir apparent, so we'll put him in the leadership and we'll go forward. Um, this could potentially destroy the party as well, and we could potentially see Paul Hinman of the Wild Rose Independence Party, a conservative party, grow back up. And I, out of the three leadership candidates that I've listened to so far, they're all talking about unity, but that's that's before the fight begins, right? Because now you have to actually get out there and say, why are you better than the people who are you running against? And that's when things get nasty. Yeah. And let's see if the WEF comes becomes a big thing in Alberta politics here. Who, what cabinet minister went into the WEF? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> don't let them hear you. <laughs> don't don't let anyone hear. I just said the WEF. Hey, I'll talk to anyone. I've always said that on the show. The only people that I won't talk to are you know you, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> I want to turn to more uh, the conservative movement now. Um, we saw Boris Johnson earlier this week get a vote of non-confidence on Saturday. On Monday, sorry. I remember because I was up because I couldn't sleep Sunday night. So I was up because I was having so much pain. And because this is what I do on night, I look, I look at the numbers, and I'm al I'm always about the guy. I'm always about the what do the numbers mean, and what do they mean in retaliation to a, re a relationship to the previous leader. So Boris Johnson had a vote of non-confidence because uh, members of his party, uh, 54 members of his party, went to the chair of the 1922 committee, which I can talk about that in a full other conversation. But in UK politics. Um, they held a vote. He won the vote with 211 voted for his leadership to stay on as leader. 148 voted no to kick him off. Uh, that is 58.8% of the vote. So roughly a little bit more than what Jason Kenney got in his leadership race. Uh, th these numbers are important because I just want to go back. Yeah. 2018, Theresa May, the then leader of the Conservative Party, Prime Minister of Canada, a uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> I like how Maddie's just walking away. She's like, I'm, it's good. It's going to be a long winded diatribe. Here. This is good content. <laughs> exactly. In 2018, Theresa May, then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and leader of the Conservative Party, had the exact same thing happen to her. Uh, members of the backbench went to the chair of the 1922 committee and forced a leadership review, uh, a vote of non-confidence in the leader. In that vote, Theresa May got 200 votes yes, 117 no. 
she had 63.1% of the caucus supporting her. Boris Johnson has 58.8. He has less than what Theresa May had in percentage wise. This has all to do with COVID. COVID, COVID, COVID. Uh, similar to Jason Kenney, Boris Johnson had Partygate, which he had events at Downing Street during COVID when he was telling people to stay at home. Jason Kenney had Sky Palace with Jason Nixon, Travis Taves, Tyler Shandro, uh, having a like really expensive uh, alcohol. It wasn't expensive. It was economical whiskey <laughs> oh, to expensive whiskey taste people. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So I asked this question. Do the conservative members and voters hold their politicians to higher standards than other party leaders? I think the exact opposite. Really? Uh, I, I would not say that Mr. Kenny or Mr. Johnson have been held to a high standard because they haven't. They, they have been able to maneuver. And I think it's sort of that a lot more sharks who look for maneuverability in that sort of lead the pack by take down the previous Caesar sort of thing or, or, or take the space. Um, Boris and Kenny both had COVID stumbles. Boris and Kenny both had backbencher issues. Boris and Kenny both had large mandates coming in, but uh, smaller mandates jeopardized their leadership. They both won by the skin of their teeth. Kenny was unable to continue going, but Boris is. He still has some wind in his sails, and as long as he's moving, he's able to go. Um, I think a great contrast is as a conservative, so he, they recently took a, a windfall tax. Uh, with energy prices soaring, producers made huge profits and inflation is high. In Alberta or in Canada, we hear some conservatives talking about cut taxes. But in the UK, UK conservatives put a windfall tax to tax these big producers to pay out basically Ralph bucks to everyone to afford, uh, look, big producer companies, you made all this money, not from anything you did, but just from world situations that are affecting the other half of the equation. I cannot see the Kenny side of conservatism saying we're going to take from this large group of people or we're going to take from this windfall of people who have bags of money for no reason and give it so that our system and our neighbors keep working. I can see other conservatives doing that, but I think this might be a parting point of a lot of people in the conservative movement are now feeling the consequences of Reaganism and Thatcherism. 40 years of horse blinders and remove the externalities, get to the profits. This is uh, F around and find out. We're at the find out point. And a lot of these people are facing issues that are so foreign to them. They feel that their civil liberties are being taken away. Um, but in countries that have a base of conservatives who see pressures and see the benefits of inter-social rivalries work in a different way. I think it's sort of interesting on that front, but also, yeah, if you look in Canada, some politicians would do that. I think Doug Ford and Kenny being on the same poster is gone. He followed the way of listening to the people. And even, even though I'm going to have to do things the other side would do, I'm going to do it and embrace it and take the leadership point. Populism to stay with the crowd, as opposed to sort of the other type of conservatism push these days populism uh with your bring your own crowd so we're going to make them we're going to farm them we're going to have them support of a lot of ideologies and see the benefits of of russian intervention in uh, in a neighbor country or whatever it is and then there's the populist conservatives that say i want to be in charge so that i get some of my ideology through as opposed to ramming it down the throat i think I think that's very, it's going to be evident, especially in Alberta, not because Alberta is a special case, but because we have uh, an old guard candidate and an old guard experienced outsider, Leela here, talking about truth and daylight 
versus keeping the system going. And then other narratives all around. I don't know if there's enough unity in conservative land to not or to keep things together. The stage horses are running in all directions and the arms are getting tired. This is how many leadership races in the past how many years? Like they're getting really good at it. Um, they're, get, uh, this, they're getting really good at the math and the, the equations and strategies, but it's telling that they can't keep a leader long enough to lead. Well, they just a, manage to get by. Well, it, but it, Boris is forever. <laughs> Boris, Boris is just not going to go down without a fight. Um, you, you mentioned it there, and I know we talked about this at the beginning of the episode, and that's why this everything comes back full circle in this show because it's what a point of order. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the conservatives and their game to win the next election. Because right now, polls have them neck and neck with the NDP here in Alberta. We can talk about federally later on in another episode, but here in, uh, here in Alberta, they're neck and neck with the uh, uh, NDP. Now, I, I, I've told this analogy a few times on the show, but I like telling it over and over again. I had the pleasure to interview one of the leadership candidates in 2013 who ran for the Alberta NDP. And while I was a reporter in Lloyd Minster, and I asked the candidate at the time what they what their uh, policy on agriculture was, and their 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 tongue in cheek answer, which still mind boggles me, was Alberta NDP have never traditionally done well in in rural Alberta, so we don't have an agriculture policy. Which yeah, um, this was a leadership candidate. Maybe they did afterwards, but here nor there. I think it's really telling that a lot of people think a lot of political empowerment in our rural parts of the country was like stripped away in the 70s and 80s. Like the system changes brutalize that and it just leads to this overall thought. There is capability there and there are policies, but geez Louise, sorry. Yeah, I always found that interesting. Um, the NDP need to do well either in rural Alberta or downtown Calgary. Now, by the looks of it, they're putting all their fo focus in on downtown Calgary. Um, Edmonton is kind of a lost cause for the Conservatives. Rural Alberta is their, like, the rural Alberta is the UCP equivalent to NDP's Ed Edmonton. Calgary is going to be the, the base of the next election. Does the UCP turn its sights onto Edmonton and try to pick up seats there, or is it a lost cause? And how does the uh, UCP navigate a general election when they are no longer the United Conservative Party and more of the divided Conservative Party? Yeah. Um, we might be at the time that the motorcycle and the sidecar part of the United Conservative Party. The motorcycle will still be united, but there'll be a lot less people on board. Um, I think depending on who wins leadership, there's opportunities for a swell in uh, alternative conservative vote going. Um, similar to the 2015 election. If enough people, if the Kenny preferred candidate or the perceived Kenny preferred candidate wins under circumstances questionable. I don't foresee Mr. Jean and Vito Marciano. I don't see a lot of those people being quiet and going away. If you can't win after using all these processes, you're going to leave the party. Um, so depending how the leadership race plays out, you might have a bigger, less united or a smaller but united party going forward. And some of that some of those equations, it might be, maybe we don't go in rural and we go Calgary and every 50K or 50K size city there is. Maybe there's other math gambits that work. Um, but it's... It's going to be hard be a, for them, right? It like, this is not an easy, like most people would assume because... Yes when, and no. If, if, you, if you're the front runner of the leadership, let's say you're the leadership race, you get the momentum, you flip the perfect pancake, you roll the perfect sausage, you have the perfect toe down and you get the shit off your shirt. Let's say that carries through barbecue season, you win the leadership race, 
You have the momentum. Now you're the premier with six months for the election. It's the red zone. But just before the red zone, you make enough promises to get you over that line where you can't make any more commitments or you, where you can't do anything. And then you can use that of, I didn't have enough time to do the rest, but I did this one thing good. There's a chance to carry, carry all the momentum and just, if people want to jump off the train, they can jump off when you're going full steam ahead. It um, harkens back to the days of Ralph Klein when Don Getty stepped down and Ralph Klein took over. The PCs were in a slump, but Ralph Klein came in, called the election, won a larger majority, even though some expected the Liberals to win in 1993, but Ralph Klein was able yeah, to pull The it two out. best things Kenny has done for the United Conservative Party is creating it and leaving it. Um, the polls have, like, if you look at the poll bounce, there is a benefit. People trust the UCP more when the leader isn't around to carry out their their uh, objectives. Well, it goes back um, to the 2019 as soon as the leader election, gets in, right? it goes back to the yeah. 2019 election where they the voters didn't like the NDP, but they liked Rachel Notley. The voters didn't like the Jason Kenney, but they liked the UCP. And what the ultimate dream for most... Con- uh, vo- I know a lot vo- of voters who like Rachel Notley. No, that, that's what I mean. <laughs> no, who liked Rachel Notley, but didn't like... I know a lot of voters like who like the-, the NDP. But, but I get what you're saying. I get thank, what you're saying. Thank you. One leans into their last name, the other leans into the party name. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave on this question for you, Maddie. Doug Ford just won a massive majority by being more progressive than conservative. He kicked out people from his own caucus when they weren't uh, vaccinated. Can the UCP learn anything from Doug Ford or would they even want to? <laughs> um, I think parts. The parts who want to make the legacy of the first chapter anything other than it was rough and poorly managed, they're going to have a different narrative. But there's a lot to learn from digging in versus having a stance, keeping to it, understanding the other side, and finding the right steam release. If you have the right pressure release valve, you can keep going for as long as you want, as Doug Ford is finding out. Kenny and the thought of don't let any pressure out leads to boiler explosions. Uh, <laughs> Or people getting scalded. Yeah. Um, I Go ahead. I think there's that huge difference between. But if 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 you're not Taves and if you're not someone who is all about the ideology or who has backers who are are encouraging certain behaviors, uh, if you have the mobility, yeah, it's working for Mister Ford in a time that every state down south is pivoting to. Hoo wee cray cray. Uh, Doug Ford is pivoting to keep the keep the the noble obligation to make sure the masses aren't mad and the masses aren't uh, suffering too much. Um, and I think uh, that's the key: keep them from suffering too much. He's I, able to, to carry out some of his. Yeah, I'm never one to speak at a turn and never to uh, quote someone that I don't give them credit for. I interrupt all the time. No, I just want to make sure I credit this to Sarah Biggs because she said this the best when I had her on with Dan Harris, the former MP for Scarborough, uh, on our Ontario election night special. And she, she talked about how Ford is the best marketer. He can market like ice to like Inuit, right? Like he could go up to none of it and sell ice in the middle of none of it and people would buy it because he's such a good marketer he was able to market not the pc brand but his own brand and i'm, I'm paraphrasing here she didn't say all that she just said she was a best marketer and i'm adding on to that so if you're going to send negative comments send it to chris brown don't send it to sarah biggs um i, I want to ask that question in relationship to the ucp who do you see as the best marketer in the potential list of Todd Lowe and Leela here, Travis Taves, Daniel Smith, Brian Jean, Bill Rock, Rajan Sani, Michelle Rempel Gardner. Because I don't see like a Pierre Polyev in this group or a Doug Ford in this group, a person who I'd say, I know that person. Okay, we all know Leela here. I kind of know Todd Lowen from him getting kicked out of cabinet. Daniel Smith crossed the floor. Like there's no one that I can say they are the 
conservative heir apparent to this movement? I I think that there's benefit for those. If you're not looking to be the conservative inheritor, but the inheritor of a ruling party, uh, then there are marketers who can win. Raj Insani uh, is someone who has made some of the right moves by a lot of people's choices or is seen to be making some of the right moves to the point that she shot up and a year ago, if this would have happened, her name wouldn't have been mentioned in the mix, but it is now. And she can market that any way she wants. She, her voice and direction isn't known, so she can create whatever marketing scheme she wants and go from there. The other person who I think has that opportunity is Leela here. She is someone that I've personally seen. I've seen at events that a lot of people say she shouldn't be going up to. She gives a speech and stares at people like me, shaking the head throughout, but she's still there. She's not uncomfortable to market herself as someone willing to come to those situations. That doesn't win you a conservative crown, but that could win you the premier. And if you become the premier, then you get to define what conservatism is in Alberta. And probably if you have the momentum, uh, you can define what it means to be a conservative premier in the prairies and in Canada. Doug Ford is in Doug Ford land, and you're right, he is a good marketer, but he's marketing his survival above other things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the Nunavut line, um, but he is good at branding and selling his authentic self. And his authentic self is someone who stumbles, but he highlights the fact that he stumbles and he carries on about his business. Or, or he's like the person who like stumbles and it's like, oh, no, I'm cool. I meant to do that. But he finds a way that the crowd keeps going as opposed to saying like, really, bro, you just got, you just got hit by a bus or whatever, or whatever the case may be. Insert cultural reference here. <laughs> um, Maddie, we are past the hour mark. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we have dived into a lot tonight and we've just scratched the surface. Um, we will have you back on, but before we go, we will have you back on next Thursday. Maddie and I are going to be sitting down and talking about a very important issue that is affecting uh, many Canadians from coast to coast to coast right here, right now. Um, and that is the X marker. And now you might be going, what does, what do you mean by that, Chris? What is the X marker? I'm going to let Maddie give the, uh, one and a half minutes, uh, cold notes version of what the X marker is. So that way you turn in for our hour and five minute conversation next Thursday on the cross border interviews. So Maddie, what is the X marker? Perfect. Thanks for that. It sounds like a TV show, but it's basically this. I'll tell it through my story. There's some who have stories like mine, some who don't. But if you look into your wallet, you have an ID that will have an M or an F for sex. And that's the sex that when the doctor pulled out, that's what they wrote down. That didn't match up for me, but I didn't want to switch from an M marker to an F because that didn't match up for me. Three years ago, the federal government said, we're going to have a three marker system, X, M, F. People like me walk through the gates, get their IDs changed. And although all systems have changed and we recognize gender rights in this country, uh, WestJet and Air Canada haven't been able to fix their system in three years. And WestJet has been, uh, has been playing a poor ally on the road. So there's a lot to talk about and to hear. There's been a lot of development since. I had an 11 p.m. phone call uh, the other night with a uh, WestJet uh, exec. He sent an email at uh, 10 15 or whatever so he must have had a long meeting and i felt it must have been great to return that call if it was so urgent I'm, and i'm glad he took it lots to develop but a great show hopefully that's uh, a minute and, uh, and 30 in in your world because i don't think hey, it, it was, was online it was perfect maddie um so with that that has been point of order on the cross-border interviews with chris brown we will be back live next Wednesday at 7.45 Mountain Standard Time uh, with Sarah. Uh, maybe we'll be bringing Maddie yeah, back. Sarah. Uh, we'll recoup to see how Maddie did today, and then we'll go back from there. But we will have Maddie back on the show for sure for Point of Order. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, for anyone who's listening to this live, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And for anyone who's listening to this when it airs on Friday for the audio version, um, 
thanks for listening to the entire show. And uh, keep talking, everyone, because uh, our democracy is better when we all have conversations. And get out from me on social media. I know it, it's easy to pound in 140 characters or 280, however many you want, but it doesn't do anything. And at the end of the day, the, the, the majority of people in this world are not on social media, so you're yelling into a vacuum. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. Remember, guys. Thank you.